Okay, so let's start. So, <clears throat> hi, uh, we are very happy to have Puyah Hatami from Ohio State University, sorry, the Ohio State University, give uh, our sixth and um, final talk for the summer. Puyah received his PhD at the University of Chicago. He held postdoc position at DIMAX and the Institute for Advanced Study, as well as at UD Austin. And he started at Ohio State um, a year ago as an assistant professor. His work focuses on pseudorandomness, analysis of Boolean function, combinatorics, and higher order free analysis. And today he's going to talk about this beautiful work that constructs pseudorandom generators from polarizing random works. This is uh, quite an inspiring uh, work that, that already have several uh, follow ups and maybe. We would mention a few of them as well in the talk. So I'm very uh, happy. Yeah. To thank you, Abishai. Um, and I want to thank you and uh, Prasad and the organizers for organizing such a great lecture series. It's been very nice uh, watching all these other great talks. I'm very happy to, to talk uh, today. Uh, as Abishai mentioned, so this, uh, this uh, talk is about pseudorandom generators and a new way to construct pseudorandom generators. Um, so the main part of the talk is a, uh, from a joint work with Ishan Chattopadhyay, at, who's at Cornell University, Kaba Hosseini, who's a postdoc at CMU, and Shahar Lovet, who's at UCSD. Uh, but uh, so the talk, uh, this paper is almost two years old now, and there's uh, quite a few developments since then that I will try to mention them uh, along the way. Um, okay, thanks. Um, so so the, the context of the talk is within pseudorandomness in computation, where we will have two key insights, where the first point of view is that we will treat randomness as a valuable resource that we want to try to use as less as possible, uh, just like um, time and space. So we would, when we want to solve problems, we would like to solve them using as few random, true random bits as possible. And the second insight is that uh, from experience, repeatedly, it has uh, randomness has shown itself to be a very powerful tool if you want to solve a problem with uh, tools from probabilistic method, etc. And if you believe in these two points of view, a very natural question that arises is uh, whether we can reduce or remove the randomness that an algorithm uses without uh, increasing other resources that it uses by much, for example, without uh, increasing the time by much. And, um, and if we could answer this question in uh, various instantiations of it, uh, it would be really great because we could use the power of randomness to solve problems, then you know, use our answer to this question to get rid of the randomness, or at least reduce the amount of randomness that that algorithm uh, uses. Um, and one general way to do that is, uh, and you know, famous examples of these problems are whether we can uh, de-randomize polynomial time randomized algorithms or logarithmic space randomized algorithms in the two-sided or one-sided error kit setting. And one general way to try to answer this question is to construct pseudorandom generators. Um, and pseudorandom generators are a powerful tool and uh, and are a generic way to de-randomize algorithms or re reduce the randomness that they use. And um, the way they're defined is by sort of forgetting about the input of the algorithm. So let's say that you wanted, you had an algorithm that you want to de-randomize. You only think of it as a function of its random bits. So if it was using n bits, now you're dealing with an n variate Boolean function. Uh, and the pseudorandom generator is simply another distribution on n bits that's not uniform, but fools the algorithm. So this function f that we have. And by fools, we mean that the, in expectation, the outcome of f is very close to the outcome of f on the output of the generator. So we say that a generator is a, is a Okay, it's a map from 0, 1 to the s to 0, 1 to the n. So it's producing an n bit pseudorandom distribution using only s truly random bits. And s is called the seed of this generator, the seed length of the generator. 
Um, and ideally, we would like s to be very small compared to n. So the smaller the s, the, the less randomness that this reduction is going to, to have. So the, our new algorithm will basically, instead of using n truly random bits, it will first uh, flip s coins and then plug it into g and then use that as if it was its randomness. Um, and you can see that if we want this new algorithm to also have be computationally bounded, we would ideally need g to be easy to compute. And easy to compute is based on the application that you have in mind. If you want to de-randomize log space, if you want this to be you know, small space computable, et cetera. Um, OK. Um, so it will be easier, and just for, for the formulas to be shorter, to write a pseudorandom generator to actually as just a random variable during this talk. So we will just say a random variable over the Boolean cube is a pseudorandom generator if the expectation of f under the uniform distribution is close to the expectation of f under this uh, pseudorandom variable. Uh, and it will also, because a lot of the tools we will use are going to be analytic, uh, it will be very convenient to think of the Boolean cube instead of 0, 1 to the n as minus 1, 1 to the n. Okay, so this will allow us to do things like Fourier analysis where the characters will just become monomials instead of like one to the six, et cetera. Um, and we still think of X as a pseudorandom generator. So when we say that it requires a small seed, uh, what that means is that you can think of X as the output of some generator that uses S truly random bits in order to, to generate these N bits that we wanted. And pictorially, you can think of it as if this like three-dimensional cube that we have is the, the whole n-dimensional Boolean cube. You want to come up with this sparse subset of its vertices, so which are these blue points, in a way that no matter what function I pick from this family of uh, the curly f family of functions that I have, uh, the expectation of that function over the blue points is going to be very close to its true expectation over all of the points. So this is kind of a strong statement because we have the same set of points, which is the support of X, and it works for all of the functions that are in the family. Okay, so that's, what, that's why a pseudorandom generator is kind of a powerful tool. It doesn't care which F we it's fooling, it's going to give it the same distribution. Um, and I forgot to mention, so if at any part there's any questions, please stop me. Um, uh, the, the whole goal is to cover a lot of the details and I, I hope that everyone can follow. So there's no very deep uh, stuff going. Um, so some examples of families of tests that you would want to fool, for example, if you want to de-randomize polynomial time, it suffices to fool all politicized circuits. Or if you want to de-randomize um, log space, uh, it suffices to fool all polynomial with read once branching programs. Uh, but there are, there are a family of weaker or different classes that people have uh, studied. There's several papers written. So we, we do care about you know, bounded uh, depth circuits, bounded depth circuits with parity gates, half spaces, polytopes. Um, uh, uh, you know, a lot, uh, the list goes on. Um, um, but I want to give you two examples of very simple classes of tests that turn out to be very important. So they have simple constructions, but they, they turn out to play a very important role in constructions of pseudorandom generators. So the first one is the example of k-wise independence, independent distributions. So let's think of uh, the family of tests that are k hun tests. So for now, we are thinking of a family of functions over n bits, right? So, so throughout the talk, um, even though f will be an infinite family, so for we will, tr we will assume that it's just a subset of n variate Boolean functions. So now let's think of the family of n variate tests that ignore all but k of their input bits. Right? So let's think of all of these one tests. Um, and we call a distribution k-wise independent if it's uh, uh, it, if it perfectly fools this family with error zero. And this kind of distribution uh, construction turns out to have very close connections with coding theory, uh, 
codes that have large distances. And through this connection, you can construct very good uh, uh, pseudo-random generators for this family uh, with seed length that's big O. And, and if you think about it, so once you fool all K juntas, what this really tells us is that you have a pseudo-random distribution over N bits that if you look at any of the K bits, uh, and you only look at that window, you have a truly uniform distribution, right? So the projection to any k bits is truly uniform. So it does look like something that you could use other places. Um, and another really um, central um, concept is the concept of small bias generators. Uh, and this is where instead of look fooling juntas, we want to fool all Fourier characters, which as I mentioned, so once we are over minus one, one to the n, uh, these are just the set of all monomials over n variables, multilinear monomials, because xi squared is equal to xi, if, uh, if we care about them as a function. Um, and initiating from the work of this, these were studied from starting from the work of Naur and Naur, where they gave a very good construction that achieves seed length log n over epsilon with error epsilon and the constants in this construction have been improved over the years, the best of which being a, a work of Amnon Tajma from a few years ago. Um, but how do we construct pseudorandom generators for other classes of functions? Um, surprisingly, I want to claim that there isn't that many ways. So in fact, in a high level, there's only three ways we know how to construct pseudorandom generators. The first of which, so each of them very fruitful. Uh, the first of which, not that related to this talk, is uh, the hardness versus randomness uh, phenomenon, where we assume that we have a function that's really hard for the class that we want to fool and try to use it as a gadget into constructing a pseudorandom generator that stretches few bits to um, more bits. Um, the second way is to just pick one of these basic generators that we already have constructed, such as small bias distributions or k-wise independence, and just realize that that's just enough for to fool this class of function tests that you have at hand. And it turns out that this works sometimes. For example, the, you know the famous example that. Braverman showed that uh, k-wise independence fools bounded depth circuits, or we know that bounded wise uh, independence fools half spaces. And a third, maybe you know, broader way of constructing pseudorandom generators is well, maybe one copy of an epsilon bias distribution doesn't fool your family. Uh, what if I use several of them and put them together in some sort of clever way? Uh, you can see that this is a little bit more loosely defined, this third category, and you can put a lot of different things into this. So one simple example of this is the result of Viola, who showed that if I just take the XOR of D copies of uh, epsilon bias generators, uh, that will be able to fool degree D F2 polynomials. So this is a very simple way of putting together just these small bias generators. And it turns out to, it can actually fool degree df2 polynomials. Um, but again, because I sort of loosely define this, this area, so there's other um, really powerful methods that kind of fall into the same way, right? So there's this method of pseudorandom restrictions that was initiated by Aitai and Wigderson and um, a, Avishai a few weeks ago gave a very nice talk. And if you're interested in learning more about it, um, you should uh, go check that out in the workshop at Stuck. Um, so, so the method of pseudorandom restrictions is, well, you know, instead of XORing the, these small bias generators, what if we just keep picking subsets of the n bits that we want to generate in a pseudorandom way and fill them in using these basic generators that we have and keep repeating until we have an n bit pseudorandom distribution. Um, so again, so sort of the constructions are simple, the analysis is usually harder because you have to somehow show that it fits. And this talk in, in a way falls into this category also. So we will show how to construct a pseudorandom generator using simple building blocks. But what makes this uh, new method 
slightly fall outside of this number three framework is that the building blocks are going to be a new kind of objects that we define. Um, so we will define these new building blocks that we call fractional PRGs, which pictorially I can, I can show it uh, in this way. So, you know, a PRG was required to pick vertices of the cube, but well, we require, we allow a fractional PRG to pick points that are inside of the solid cube. Um, this at the first glance may not make any sense. So we have a Boolean function, how do we even evaluate it and so on. Um, so let's see how do we formalize this kind of intuition. Um, so for now, uh, let's assume that we are given a family of Boolean functions and various Boolean functions that we want to fool. And we want to come up with the actual pseudorandom generator such that the expected value of f of x minus expected value of f is at most epsilon. <clears throat> so we are dealing with a family of Boolean functions. And almost always, the one of the right first things to do is write its Fourier expansion and, and see what we can, we can deduce from there. Right? So one of the first things that it does, so, so the Fourier expansion looks like something like this. So you have the empty Fourier coefficient, and you have a Fourier coefficient for any non-empty subset of the indices. You have a real coefficient f hat of s. Um, and you have these monomials, products of xi, which are the characters. Um, so the, a first simple observation here is that if you look at the expected value of f over the uniform distribution, everything here just vanishes and you get a fat of empty. So, well, didn't do so much, but at least it's, we, we can rewrite the definition of a PRG by saying that I want to come up with a distribution X such that this expectation approximates the empty Fourier coefficient. But I wanna do something more now that, uh, that's gonna be uh, interesting. Um, so we wrote this Fourier expansion of F here and at this point, we can forget about the fact that f was Boolean, right? We have a polynomial at our hand right now over n variables. And we can plug in any real numbers that we want to. Um, and we know that this polynomial is multilinear because uh, x i's appear with powers 0 and 1. Um, so this is what we call the multilinear extension of f. So now we have a function that takes values inputs from Rn and produces the real number. Um, and having this, we can define this sort of, um, you know, maybe look silly at, at first, but it will have meaning later. Um, so we will define a fractional PRG to be any random variable that takes values in the solid cube and the expected value of the multilinear extension of F over X is close to f of zero. And you can see that once we think of the extension of f, f of zero is really f hat of empty set. That's why I replaced the f hat of empty set with f of zero. Right? So this is a definition that's, that now makes sense. Um, and just to have some intuition of how, you know, how these things work. So let's just look at a simple example. So let's think of this two-variate Boolean function that's on and of two bits. So x1 and x2 is going to output one only if both of the inputs are one. And you can check that the Fourier expansion of f is of this form. So the empty Fourier coefficient is minus one half. So this polynomial produces the right, the correct uh, outputs on the Boolean inputs, but we can actually evaluate it on any real numbers. Uh, and in fact, if you just focus on the solid cube, so if I plug in one half and one half, I get one over eight. If I plug in zero and zero, I get the expectation, right? And this is what we will use and what we used in the definition of the uh, fractional PRGs. Um, and this sort of the multilinear extension of F has very nice properties that will allow us to, to, to to make meaning of what does it mean for evaluating the extension at a rand at some point a in the cube, not just the all zeros. Um, so the very simple but useful fact about the extension of f is that if I 
look at the expectation of f on a random variable that has a product distribution. So I have some x that has a, the, all of its variables are independent. Then by multilinearity and linearity of expectation, expected value of f on x is the same as f evaluated at expectation of x, right? So you can just bring the expectation inside because everything is independent and you just get f, the extension of f evaluated as expectation of x as input variables. Um, why is this useful? It's useful because if I'm given some arbitrary vector inside of the solid cube, this idea allows me to write f of a as, an ex, as some sort of expectation of uh, f evaluated at the vertices of the cube. And the way to do it is to come up with a random variable that has a product distribution, uh, expectation of which is AI. So one way to achieve it is to output, you know, for, to fix each coordinate to, to equal to one with probability one plus AI over two and minus one with probability one minus AI over two. So if you take the expectation, you just get AI. Um, and you can also sample this. So depending on the problem that you're working, there's, there's different ways to sample the same distribution. So you could also say, I want to you know, output sine of AI with probability absolute value AI and uh, just output a uniform bit otherwise. And, and this will also have the same, it's the same distribution, it's just a different way to look at it. So, you know, depending on how the kind of problem that you're trying to think about. Um, so, so what this tell, told us is that F of any point in the solid cube is just some expectation of F evaluated at the vertices of the cube. Um, and again, so pictorially, uh, Let's say I have a Boolean function on the whole you know, zero, minus one, one to the n. So let's say this is the red points or the evaluations of f on those red points. A PRG is just a set of blue points um, that such that the expected value of f over those points. So here it's one third. It's one third plus one third minus one third. It's close enough to f evaluated at the center of the cube, and in, in the definition of an F PRG, we allow picking the blue points inside of the cube. Okay, and ideally this should help. And you should by now have realized that this will help too much. Um, I haven't restricted what points do we pick and we want to approximate the value of F at the center. So why not just pick the center? Um, and if you pick the center, you will have an error zero and you will actually fool all Boolean functions. Right, so there's some restrictions we should put if we want to make this useful. And in the rest of the talk, I will show that if you add some non-triviality assumptions, then fractional PRGs are useful. And in what sense? In the sense that they, we can actually use them to construct actual PRGs. Um, so the zero FPRG is not useful, whatever this non-triviality is. Um, and and then in the next part of the talk, I will convince you that FPRGs are easier to construct in some sense than PRGs by giving you uh, generic constructions of fractional PRGs from some assumptions on Fourier tail bounds or assuming that the family of functions simplifies under ran like truly random restrictions. Okay, so let's move on to uh, how to construct PRGs using fractional PRGs. So now we will assume that we have access to a fractional PRG. I'm not gonna for now care about how it's constructed. So we are just given a random variable that takes values inside of the solid cube. And we want to construct that and that it epsilon fools the family that we want. And we want to construct an actual PRG. And the general idea will be to define some sort of random walk inside of the solid cube that converges to the vertices of the cube. And we will think of the out the you know the endpoints of this random walk as the PRG. And we will show that this this works. And it's 
easy to see that the first step of this random walk is easy to define. So first of all, let's agree that the center of the cube is the, the right, the correct uh, starting point. And that's because f of zero is what we want to approximate anyway. Right? So if we start there, we know that at the, at the center, we don't have any error. And we are given this random variable x, the expected value of which is close to the f evaluated at center. So why not just jump to that x? Um, and, and next, we will show that we can actually continue this walk somehow. Right? Um, and we can't just simply keep adding x independent copies of x, because then it will be hard to argue. You could jump outside of the cube, et cetera. So we will have to do it in a very in a careful way. Um, and we will need two assumptions to be able to both continue this random walk and to make some sense, some sort of progress. So progress to us will be to, with high probability, get closer and closer to the vertices of the cube. And this will require x to be non-trivial, to have some sort of vari like uh, you know, large variances on its coordinates. And to be able to make progress, we will make one assumption that f, the family, is closed under fixing its inputs. Okay. So let me just formally define these two conditions that we need. So the non-triviality condition, we call it p-noticeability. We say that a random variable x is p-noticeable if all of its coordinates have you know, some larger than p variance. Um, and an important example to keep in mind is a random variable that's basically p times some true Boolean vector. So it's a random variable, all of coordinates of which are minus p or p to the n. And this will be p squared noticeable. Okay, So there's this square actually becomes important in some applications. Um, and this closeness under restriction, so I have to clarify. So I, I, I promise you that we are thinking of f as a family of functions over n variables. So what does it mean if I fix some of the inputs, it's still in the family. So we will still think of it as a, the restricted function as a junta on n variables. It's just ignoring the fixed input bits. Uh, so we say f is closed if, if you pick any f in the family and you fix some of the input bits, the new function is still in the family, okay? And pretty much all of the classes that I mentioned in my earlier slides have this property. So it's, I mean, there could be some interesting classes that are not closed under restrictions, um, but most of the, the ones that we care about turn out to be closed under restrictions. Okay. And here's the main theorem that, uh, that shows this reduction from FPRGs to PRGs, um, from PRGs to FPRGs. Uh, which says that if I have access to an FPRG that epsilon fools the family and it's P noticeable and we are closed under restrictions, then there is a PRG of the form some, some gadget G applied to T independent copies samples from the fractional PRG and it's epsilon times T fools F. And this works if you pick t to be roughly one over the noticeability parameter times log n over epsilon. So this is the analysis that I will show. And in fact, if you're more careful, you can do a little bit better in terms of dependence on epsilon and so on. Um, but, but this is what we will show. So this version of the theorem is what we will show. And this g is going to be our random walk gadget, right? So G itself is, has no randomness. So all of the randomness of this construction is just sampling T copies of X1 up to X. It's just T independent copies of X. So the seed length will be just T times whatever the seed length of X was, okay? Um, so let's go back to this idea of the random walk. So we agreed that we will start at the center of the cube. So now I'm making it two dimensional because it's easier to, to visualize. Um, and the first step of the random walk, we agreed that it's good to just use uh, X as the first step. So how do we continue? And to see how to continue, we just need to argue that 
if my starting point was at some point A, arbitrary point A, how do I continue this walk with a new sample from X? And it turns out the right, at least one way that, that works is to look at the largest subcube uh, that is centered at A. So we know how to move from center of a cube using X. So let's make A the center of some other cube that we don't jump out of the original solid cube, right? So we look at the largest subcube that has this property and we want to use X in some sort of, in a scaled way to move inside of that cube. And to make th that definition, I will just make these uh, two simple definitions. So given a vector A, we, let's define delta A to be just the distances of each coordinate of A from the boundary. So these will be sort of the dimensions of that cube. Um, and let's define X circ Y to be just the coordinate wise product of the two, work, two vectors X and Y. So having that at hand, so it turns out that this is the, the right way to, to make the next step of the, the walk. So we go from A to A plus basically a new, a fresh copy of X, but we multiply each coordinate of X by, you know, how much could we, uh, making sure that it's just, we do, we're not jumping outside of the original solid cube. So this is as large as we could multiply by never jumping outside of the cube, right? So that's the, that will define our random walk. And we need to see why this works. And, the next lemma shows why this works. So it will show that one step of such a random walk doesn't cause much error in approximating f of a. So if I start at any point a and I jump from a to a plus delta a circ x, this ex in expectation, I'm still close to f of a. And for the final walk, we have to just apply this lemma t steps and apply some triangle inequality. Okay. So how do we prove this? So the general idea is that, well, we know that the family F is closed under restrictions. And I know that this distribution X fools all the functions that are in the family. So if I can write this statement as a linear combination, as, as a convex combination of other functions that are in the family, but centered at zero instead of A, then I'll be done because now I know that when center that's zero, X fools all of those functions in expectation. So to make it formal, let's, let's make this definition. So I will define a random variable R of X. So X is the input is some vector X. So R of X has a product distribution. It's ith coordinate is equal to sine of AI with probability absolute value AI. And it's otherwise, it's just xi, okay? So it's some sort of random restriction vector. So with some probability, we are fixing that to ai. Otherwise, we're just taking xi, right? So that's how it's defined. And you can see that the expectation of r of x is exactly this vector that we care about. It's the next step of the random walk. Does that make sense? because the expectation is absolute value of AI times sine of AI, which is just AI plus one minus absolute value of AI, which is just Delta AI times XI, right? So it's exactly this, this quantity. Um, right, so here, so here um, I mean, you use product distribution over uh, not necessarily Boolean values, right? So that's also okay, right? So yes. earlier we yes, said that exactly. uh, uh, we, we, we would think of product distribution over Boolean things, but actually this would have worked. Yes, it's, it well. works over Rn as, yeah. So right. we have multilinear polynomials. That's, right. that's true. Thanks. Um, and now we will make this definition of, so I will define a new Boolean function. So it will take F of, it will take some input X. So this capital, f of x is a random function um, for any instance of r of x, it will just evaluate f on that sort of restriction, restricted function, right? 
So this f is a random function over restrictions of f because uh, each each of these rx's fix some of the input bits to this sign of ai's, but like, but keep alive some of the x signs. Um, and now we're pretty much done. So we wanted to bound f of a minus this f of a plus delta a o x. We can write both of them as some expectation over capital F, right? Because we know that this expectation is just this. Um, so we have expectation of f f of zero and expectation over f and x of f of x. Um, and this zero appears because when you're putting the uniform, when you put x to be uniform distribution, the expectations just become zero. So it's as if you're looking at r of zero, right? So it's just f of zero. So now if you bring out this expectation over f outside, so you're looking at f capital F of zero minus expected value of over x of f, capital F at x. But remember that when you already sampled f, it's just the restriction of lowercase f. And we know that x fools all of those because the family is closed on the restrictions. So you just have a bound on epsilon. So for any of these capital Fs, this is bounded by epsilon. So the expectation is bounded by epsilon also. Okay, so very, very simple fact. And, and you can see that we crucially use the fact that the family is closed under restrictions because um, it wasn't enough that X only fools the original function lowercase f. So we would need to fool all of these restrictions. Yes, Abhishek. So it seems that um, what you need is that the you know this x fools the function f and all the restriction of the function f. Right? Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, that's true. So you know, so if if you only wanted to fool a specific f, all, what you need is to to fool all of the restrictions of it. Um, so if we wanted to come up with a random walk that fools a specific function, all, all that we care is like all of the restrictions of that F. That's true. Okay, so, so as I said, so now we have this lemma and we can apply it repeatedly for I steps. And that says that if I define my random walk using the formula that we had, so the steps are just using this boundary distance normalized copies of x, um, then the expected value of this random variable, which is just the, where we arrive at after i steps of the walk, is close to f of 0. It's at most i times epsilon, because at each step by the lemma incurs an error of epsilon. OK? So that's great. So we have managed to define a random walk, the error of which is decaying, but it's not decaying by much. Um, but remember, we wanted a, an actual PRG. So currently, this random walk, there's no guarantee that it's going to reach actually the, the vertices of the cube. And we will finish this uh, construction by showing two new ideas. So the first one is the concept of polarization. So we show that this random walk is actually polarizing, meaning that it will get very close to the vertices of the cube uh, quickly. So in logarithmic amount of number of steps, we get very close to plus minus one. And, and next we show that, well, once you're close enough, then just rounding to the nearest plus or minus one actually doesn't incur much uh, error. Okay. We have another question. Yeah. So uh, you, you said that quickly that this is some kind of hybrid argument that there uh, is at most epsilon times T. Uh -huh. Is it is it tight? I mean, it seems that maybe you know if we think of errors like uh, sometimes canceling each other's out, maybe this scales like epsilon times square root t. Uh, epsilon times square root t. If I'm thinking of yeah. errors as themselves as as random walk, right? So. Oh, I see. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, it's it's possible. I don't have a like a lower bound. I I I think in terms of t. And as I said, so this dependence on epsilon also could be improved, maybe. So like the number of steps you need doesn't necessarily have to depend on this badly on epsilon. Um, yeah, thanks. Maybe we can talk later. About that. Um, 
Okay, so but but if we believe these two new ideas of polarization and rounding, then then our job is done. So the generator will be to take t steps of the random walk that we defined and just take the signs of that that vector that we got. Okay. So how does polarization work? So we will actually show that if x is non-trivial, it's p-noticeable, and we will have to make one extra assumption about x, and that is it's symmetric. But, but this will not be very problematic, because if you have an x that's not symmetric, you can just average between x and minus x and make it symmetric, and it will still fool most of, you know, almost all of the families that we care about. Um, and what we show is that for every coordinate of the random walk, uh, the coordinate will get exponentially close to one or minus one with exponentially high probability. Right? Um, and this, this exponential, uh, exponentially small probability of being away is good enough that you can actually do a union bound. Right? So if we pick t to be log n over epsilon over p, then you can show that all coordinates with probability one minus epsilon will be close. So how do we show this? Um, first of all, this claim makes everything one dimensional. Even though we had an n-dimensional random walk, now we are just narrowing our view to one dimension. So we have just a random walk on a line starting at zero. And we have all these uh, you know, single dimensional va real variables. Um, and this is the random walk now. Um, and we know that xi is a random variable that takes values in the mi one, minus one and one interval, and it has expectation that's at least p. And we know that it's symmetric. So for example, its expectation is zero. But we will actually use the full power of that symmetry somehow, not just that the expectation is zero. And the key inequality in proving this polarization is that this walk always satisfies this inequality. It shows that one, the distance at step i from the boundary is always bounded by the distance at step i minus one multiplied by one minus xi. So no matter what the outcome of xi is, this is going to be true for this particular random walk, okay? And I'm not going to tell you why. You have to actually look at some case study depending on where, where the previous step is and you know, just make sure that this works. Um, so for example, this shows that in expectation, uh, we don't lose much. I don't know somehow. Oh, there we go. Great. So in expectation, because xi is independent of yi minus 1, we don't lose much. So the expectation of one minus xi is just one, right? So it doesn't increase. But this is not good enough for showing that we get very close to zero very fast. And the, the trick to do that is to take square roots and then do the same argument. Uh, so what we do is we take the square root of the distance from the boundary. And you can still use the independence to write it as this product. And now you have this expectation of square root one minus xi for which you can write its Taylor expansion, which turns out to be all just different powers of xi with a negative coefficient. Um, and here comes where we use the symmetry. Uh, so because x, xi is symmetric, uh, all of the odd powers have zero expectation. So the first non-zero power there is just xi squared term. So you can upper bound, and all of them had negative coefficients, so you can upper bound by this one minus expectation of xi squared over eight, which this is exactly this noticeability. So we can bound it by one minus p over eight, which for convenience, we just bound it by e to the minus p over eight. Okay. And, and once we have this, we are pretty much done. So just repeat this for t steps. So what, what it shows is that the expectation of the distance at tth step from the boundary in the square root is bounded by something exponentially small in uh, minus t. Right. Uh, and now you apply a Markov inequality and you know, take the squares after the Markov. So that's how this polarization works. It's pretty simple. Um, and as I said, so we can take t to be you know, sufficiently large and uh, 
you know, after sort of like log n over epsilon over p steps, all of the coordinates will be uh, sort of epsilon over n close to the one or minus one. So how does rounding work? Um, so for rounding, so what we will show is actually, so the difference between f evaluated at any vector x from f evaluated at sine of x is always bounded by just the L1 distance from the boundary. Okay, so that's what we will show. And again, we will show this, uh, we will use this trick of this defining a random variable, the expectation of which is x, and, and but it, uh, all of its points are Boolean. So even though x is inside of the solid cube, so we will define this uh, random variable z that has expectation that's equal to x. And we know that f of x is equal to expected value of f of z, right? And one way to define it is just to have sine of xi with probability absolute value xi and the uniform bit otherwise, right? Why is this helpful? It's because we can use this uh, definition of f of x to rewrite the inequality that we were interested in. So we wanted f of x minus f of sine. We can now write it as an expectation over z of this difference. But now z is also a Boolean vector. So whenever z is equal to sine of x, we get zero contribution. And whenever it's not, it's at most two contribution. So this is bounded by just twice the probability probability that these two vectors are not the same. So remember, sine of x is a fixed Boolean vector. Um, and the probability that z is not the sine of x, it's just by a union bound, the sum of one minus xi over two. Because with probability absolute value xi, you know, the coordinate is equal. Otherwise, we still have a one half probability of getting it right. So the probability of not getting it is just one half. And you get this two and two cancel and exactly we have the rounding uh, claim is proved. Okay. Um, to summarize, so combining polarization and the rounding theorem. So if we pick T to be log N over epsilon over P with high probability, all the coordinates are epsilon over N close. And by this theorem, just rounding yt to the closest Boolean vector will cause epsilon times epsilon over n error, which is just epsilon, another epsilon for the, just the rounding step. Um, and now we have proved this, um, this reduction theorem. So the, the final random walk will have an error t plus one times epsilon. And the things that we used was a fractional PRG that's symmetric and it's p-noticeable and that the family F is closed under restrictions. And, and you can see that now the seed length will be log N over epsilon over P times the seed length that X required, right? So if X itself was polylogarithmic and somehow P is also polylogarithmic, when we get a polylogarithmic seed length pseudorandom generator out of a fractional uh, PRG. Okay. Um, can, can you explain yeah. a little bit uh, what what is the gadget here? This gadget G. Oh, so the the gadget G is just uh, you know this whole algorithm that will it will sam it it takes as input t copies of just just t real valued vectors, and it will define these y i's where y one is x one and y two is just the next step and it does all of that and it will output just sign of the tth step of that random walk, right? So once you are given x1 and xt, everything is deterministic. You just look at what that random walk would go to and just output the sign of that, the final point in the, right? so that's the gadget G. Okay. Right? So it's not as simple as sort of maybe a random restriction or something like that. It's still right. some way of putting them together. But in, in any case, it's sort of like work coordinate by coordinate. So at least. Yes, sort of exactly. Yeah. Out. So you're, you're basically looking at each coordinate of these XIs. The first coordinate of all of the XIs determines the first coordinate of the output. So it's kind of, it's nice in that sense. 
things. Is the is there a lower bound for the number of steps needed for your polarizing random walk? Um, I'm I'm not sure of, of, of lower bounds, and I, I think that William had some argument on that. That you can't get perfect PRGs out of this, or, or but off the top of my head, I, I don't know. I, I think maybe for the one of the f like uh, corollaries that you'll have, um, yeah. there is a lower bound because otherwise you would get like a PRG for every Boolean function that is better than n or so. There, but, but which corollary, like. Uh... Yeah, you haven't talked about it yet. But. Okay, I see. For for the Fourier coefficient stuff. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So maybe we discuss this over there. So I will. Thanks, Rabu, for the. It's a great question. So, um, well, one question. So you're doing these uh, PRGs. I mean, obviously, you're assuming everything's over the reals. If you had precision limitations and so on, you just have to have a basic generator. Uh, and then you're you're fine, sort of in the basic uh, generator. Um, but I mean, if these were approximate in uh, in in any way, if I, if they were prox approximate, it still works because of this rounding argument that we had, right? So uh, you can go to the closest approximation, and the error that that incurs is going to be bounded by the L one distance from the you know the real point that you wanted. Um, Right, so it's it's sort of robust, so you can like round things um, up to error epsilon over n or something, and and not cause much error to the final generator. That that is true, though. That for now, I have been pretending we can do these real calculations um, in in you know in discrete time somehow. That's that's a good point. Thanks. Good. Good. Thanks. Okay, so. So we, we now know how to use fractional PRGs to construct PRGs. Well, now we need to construct fractional PRGs. So I'm gonna tell you how to construct fractional PRGs. Um, and I will show you how to construct them using some properties, uh, some bounds on the tails of the Fourier coefficients of the family. Okay, so let's uh, think of these two definitions. Uh, I will say that a family of Boolean functions satisfies this L1 of AB Fourier tail property, where A and B are just some parameters. If for any K that's greater than or equal to one, the sum of the Fourier coefficients in the absolute value at level K is bounded by some A times B to the K, okay? And you can sort of forget about A for now. So let's think of at the level K, the L1 norm is at most b to the k. And, and we will define similarly the L2 AB property to, to be that the L2 norm of the case levels for all levels is bounded by this time something that's exponentially small. And the reason that you know here to make it interesting, we have to make this exponentially small, but we allow this to be something that can get really large is that by parseval, the sum of all Fourier coefficients square of the Fourier coefficients at, at all levels is at most one. It's exactly one because we have a one minus one Boolean function. Um, so uh, an interesting extra a stronger property is that at level k we have this exponential decay. Right? Um, and in fact, these two properties turn out to be related. So Avishai has this uh, really nice paper where he has a tail where a table where he also relates these to random restriction lemmas, the probability that under random restriction, the degree drops and so on. Um, and he shows that the L2 tail bounds imply the L1 tail bounds. But I also want to point out that the reverse of this is the inverse is not true. Uh, and you can see by just taking the parity function. Uh, the parity function at the highest level, at the nth level, has L2 norm that is one. So it can't satisfy this L2 bound for B that is like small. Um, but, but it satisfies the L1 AB for B equal to one, right? So at all levels, L1 is at most one. In fact, most levels, it's zero. Um, so in fact, 
any interesting family of Boolean functions you have that is able to compute parity is not going to have this L2 property for good parameters, but it might have this L1 property. And, and we do know quite a lot of interesting families satisfy L1 AB or L2 AB. And when I say satisfy, of course, if you're allow full freedom on choosing B, all families will satisfy them. Uh, but uh, when I say that, I'm, I mean that like for non-trivial B. So for example, B being only polylogarithmic in N or something like that. So we know that the AC0 circuits satisfy the exponential L2 tail bounds. And we know bounded with branching programs satisfy L1 uh, bounds with B being something like log n to the W. Uh, we know bounded sensitivity functions, permutation branching programs, etc. And I actually, we conjecture that degree DF2 polynomials also satisfy this with B that is roughly exponential in D, like let's say two to the O of D. And uh, that would itself imply some new pseudorandom generators for for F2 polynomials, then, and I will talk about that later. Okay, um, so we have this, this property that a lot of the families uh, of Boolean functions satisfy. So it would be very nice to have just one generator that fools any such family of Boolean functions. And we will do exactly that. So we will show that there is a generic fractional pseudorandom generator for all families that have these uh, Fourier tail bounds. And we will forget about the family. We only will use the fact that they satisfy this Fourier tail bounds. Okay. And the construction is a one-liner. So what we do is we will sample a vector. So let's say that we have a family of Boolean functions that satisfies L1 of AB. And our construction will be just pick a small biased distribution over minus one, one to the N and normalize it by one over two B, where B is the parameter in the Fourier tail bounds. And I claim that this is a fractional BRG. And why do we only focus on L1 bounds and not L2 bounds is because since L2 bounds imply L1 bounds, so this is the most general statement. So this will also be a fractional PRG for any family that has L2 AB tail bounds. So how do we analyze this? Um, so should we take a break sometime too? Should I plan for a break? Or um, whenever you feel after, comfortable. Yeah, maybe after this we can take it. Okay. Um, so the first thing to notice is that this is a non-trivial fractional PRG um, because all of its coordinates are just one, either one over two B or minus one over two B. And this was exactly the kind of special kind of P noticeable uh, FPRG that we discussed. So each of its coordinates will have variance one, exactly one over four B squared. So all that's left is to show that this distribution fools all functions in the class, right? And the, so any function F in the class of tests is fooled by this distribution. And we will do this by Fourier analysis. So we remember that f of zero was just the empty Fourier coefficient. So this difference is just the expansion of f evaluated on the non-empty Fourier coefficients. And we just do a triangle inequality. So we bring the absolute values inside and you can already see that this is really perfectly set up for the construction. So here we just have some real value, but here we have uh, the product of Xi's, which is essentially the bias of this vector Y, but normalized by a bunch of one over two Bs, right? So let's try to write that down. So this quantity is exactly the bias of the vector y on the set S, which is at most epsilon over A by our choice. Just normalized by 2B to the size of S, right? Each of these Xi's that appear here 
was one over two beta times that sum yi. So we get a, this term one over two b to the size of s. And now all we do is we break the summation based on the size of uh, the, the Fourier coefficient. Um, and we get this Fourier coefficient divided. So you bring the epsilon outside, you get the Fourier coefficient divided by a times two b to the k. Um, and now we use this L1 tail bound. So we know that exactly what this is bounded by. So the numerator, the sum is bounded by A times B to the K, which uh, the surviving term is one over two to the K. So the whole thing is bounded by epsilon, right? It's very, very simple way to construct. And this is kind of, uh, I hope you agree that this is kind of remarkable that you know we can this simply we didn't think of what the family was. All we used was just the simple uh, calculations. And now we have a fractional PRG that is one over four B squared noticeable. And by the random walk gadget, we can turn it into an actual PRG as long as the family is closed under restrictions. Okay, so maybe this is a good time to, to pause um, and um, Oh, I, I want to just mention also the, the seed length of this construction. So all we used, all of the randomness that we used was to sample a small bias distribution. And you can do this with log n plus log a plus log one over epsilon. And you can do, you know, if you care to improve this, you can. Uh, you can do this analysis slightly more carefully um, by treating the large coefficient separately and using almost k-wise independence. And you can make the dependence on n uh, log log instead of log n. Okay. Yeah, and then so if you have any questions, please go ahead. So, Buya, uh, do you have examples yeah. of these parameters a and b for some like usual classes? Are we going to show after the break? Oh, no, I, so I, I mentioned, so for example, for with W read once branching mm -hmm. programs, you get um, something like B is equal to log N to the W maybe minus one. Avishai maybe remembers later. I think it's W minus one. Um, so you get something that's like polylogarithmic noticeable out of this. Um, so sadly, as you can see, as you can sort of compare, if you look at uh, at our paper, so I will actually show some of the applications of this, but uh, the PRGs we get are not the most competitive seed lengths. So you always are missing a square somewhere, or like you, know, you can do more clever things by looking at the family. Um, but I think it's sort of inherent. So if you want to have one PRG that fools all of these things, you, you can't hope that it's going to be optimum in all of the specific families that you're applying. Um, but there, there is a right. the case of, uh, mm -hmm. for example, for permutation with W branching programs, you have uh, this bound with B that is just uh, polynomial in the width. Right? So mm -hmm. the N, N doesn't appear. And in that case, we actually get some uh, good, like the best PRG for, those, for that case, for example. Right, thank and, you. Yeah. yeah, I guess maybe. Yeah, so this is sort of some examples of the application. And I guess I guess another application is for these low sensitivity functions. Mm -hmm. uh, this was before the sensitivity conjecture was resolved. Now we know that K was just full them. Um, yeah, so I had to like remove uh, one line from these applications, but but I guess so. So before we knew the sensitivity conjecture is correct, uh, you know, tr was proved as Avisha is pointing out. Uh, we didn't uh, know any PRG with polynomial insensitivity seed length. And um, in fact, Avishai and I had a you know, two to the square root S construction. Um, but using this uh, pseudorandom, this uh, polarizing random walks, you can get polynomial in S. But now we know that uh, bounded sensitivity is just equivalent to polynomial in S degree. So you can just use KYs independence. It's still open whether we can get linear dependence on the sensitivity. That's a nice question. 
So I have a, another comment. So it seems that everything that you're doing is specific to PRGs. Uh, so I guess uh, even if you just wanted to construct a heating set generator, like which could be much easier if it's not clear how to, to use your approach, right? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not quite sure how to, yeah. But I, I think that there could be ways of formulating this random walk to, to give you a heating set. I'm not sure if it would give any, you know, anything. Good question. There's a question in the chat. I, I don't know. Q &A. Access. Do you see the Q and A in the bottom? I can read it. I mean, somehow I only see my uh, shared screen, but not. Uh... Oh, I see. I see. If I go up. Are these L1 ABN properties good enough to cover most of the commonly seen function families? Uh, not necessarily. So I, I would say there's a lot of families that we don't know. Um, this, uh, you know, for, so one example, as I mentioned, even F2 degree D polynomials, we don't know this L1 AB bounds for a reasonable uh, B. Um, I will maybe go into the details in the case of F2 polynomials, but yeah, so there, there's definitely a lot of, uh, uh, you know, even with W branching programs, this is a quite a, you know, maybe a result from four years ago or something that we had that, that is founded. So, um, maybe just to mention that, uh, family that doesn't have this property are like like the majority function doesn't have this property. So that's one example. So it can go, it cannot go beyond TC0. Exactly. That's true. Okay, so let's take a break. Uh, let's be back in 10 minutes. <laughs> 